So we are we are online now. We can start. <sighs> Katusha, do you want to introduce? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Katusha. We are at the fourth webinar, and on this webinar about environment, labor, and justice, we have some presenters here: Camila, Silva, and Diego. Uh, now, Scott, you want to say something? Uh. Well, the uh, title of today's discussion is Environment, Labor, and Justice Perspectives from, this, uh, from the Global South. And we have three uh, speakers who were contributors to the volume hand, uh, Palgrave Handbook of Environmental Labor Studies, as well as, uh, I believe, a couple of the uh, co-editors uh, of that volume uh, who will join us in the Q and A, um, and our um, first presenter will be Silpa Satish from the um, Azim Premji uh, University in Bangalore. Uh, go ahead, Silpa. I hope you can see my slides. Can you? So thank you so much for having me. Uh, many thanks to Nora, Dimitris, and David for including this work in the handbook. And I'm particularly delighted to present this work uh, on a theme or on a session that looks at the interface of labor, nature, and uh, justice from a global South standpoint. So the case I'm trying to present today is from Kerala, which is a South Indian state. So broadly, the mandate uh, for my presentation is to try and find an answer to the question as to why labor and environmental movements end in an antagonistic relationship, uh, especially when both of these movements have participants from working class backgrounds. How can we explain such conflicts? And I do that using a case of labor environmental conflict from Kerala, which is a South Indian state, relying on qualitative research methods and looking at the ways in which the movement participants interpret their grievances, hence frame analysis. In doing all of this, the larger goal is to see uh, you know the the promise that a formidable alliance between the two movements can bring about against capitalist capitalist exploitation and to be able to build an alliance it is equally important to understand the factors that create impending tensions between these two social movements so that's where this presentation is broadly situated at so the context is uh, kerala which is a south indian state uh, which has a very long history of working class struggles it has had many communist governments it is known in the international development literature for its acclaimed model of development, uh, which achieved very high social indicators with limited to zero economic growth for a long time. However, there are also many critiques uh, uh, against you know, this acclaimed model in terms of the outliers to this uh, model of Kerala uh, model of development. The state was also there in international development news uh, for its shifting class politics from class conflict to largely in entering into a stage of compromise with uh, capitalist accumulation and investment in the state. The two movements that I am going to look at today are Periyar Anti-Pollution Campaign and Standing Council of Trade Unions, which is the local, uh, first one is a local green movement and the second one is a local um, labor movement. So this is the site of my conflict, the study. Uh, you can see there is a river flowing through uh, uh, in the image on the 
right hand side it's an industrial hub in the state of kerala there are many chemical industries located on either side of the river and the river also holds a central position in understanding the interface of tension between the two social movement groups to talk a little bit more about the setting this is the only industrial hub in the state of kerala which houses more than 400 chemical industries at some point in time it started in 1940s as a vehicle of development and modernization to also effect a shift from primitive quote and quote primitive modes of employment to more modern uh, forms of employment the availability of water and subsidized electricity played a crucial role in creating this and translating that into an industrial hub in fact soon as the expansion of industries happened the issue of pollution uh, immediately followed the region it was declared as a toxic hotspot by greenpeace in 2003 visible effects of pollution included a uh, severe river, river discoloration as well as you know industrial smog etc i would also like to situate this case within the larger literature on labor and environmental conflicts and to establish its relevance in some form some form right if you look at the literature of labor and environmental conflicts you could see it's heavily skewed towards cases from global north uh, in terms of its theoretical understanding and explanation that it comes forth and you can broadly classify this into two forms of analysis economic analysis that explain conflicts as a tension or the trade off between jobs and environmental protection and class based analysis that explain these conflicts in terms of tension between working class trade unions and middle class environmental movements however i find many problems uh, with uh, these generalized class based explanation with a case from the global south one it singularly classifies environmentalism as a middle class phenomenon when you look into the plethora of environmental movements in the global south you can see the strong presence of material grievances in them so it is a confluence of both material and ecological grievances further you know uh, challenging the understanding of environmentalism as a post materialist uh, as having a post materialist value orientation and uh with these two critics i'm also intending to bring this uh, literature on labor and environmental relations and bring it closer to the literature on social movements mainly because there has been a much touted demise of class within the social movement literature whereas in labor and environmental relations you can see the strong presence of class class so i'm also trying to bring these two bodies of literature together in understanding what is happening in kerala and Uh, uh, an ambitious claim uh, to to do a little bit more be go beyond this is to also bring to the class and environmental inequality this is equally important considering the particular trajectory of kerala's development model and left politics were environmental uh, grievances are often again associated as a middle class or you know as an elitist uh, grievance often not you know, explained in the lexicons of class politics and here i'm trying to see or trying to see how we can bring environmental inequality to the center of uh, working class politics by drawing from o'connor's work on first and second contradictions of capitalism where you clearly link environmental inequality within the structural scheme of industrial capitalism so environmental inequality stems from the ways in which capitalism organizes production and creates negative externalities at the environment and in doing that in doing so i also highlight how environmental inequality and exploitation should also be considered alongside economic inequality and exploitation which is associated with the you know uh, access to means of production uh, in terms of expanding our understanding of class so the the goal here is to see how people who are on the lower rungs of society often are uh, more or disproportionately vulnerable to the environmental inequalities and livelihood burdens created by industrial capitalism the methodology is largely qualitative ethnographic methods and i look at the interpretation or the framing of movement participants as to how they make sense of what is happening as far as pollution and class interest are concerned since the the interest is both at structural individual aspects of movement mobilization i use a combination of extended case logic and constructionist grounded theory in doing this we could also see how participants make sense of theoretical constructs such as class work solidarity etc and i could do this only because of the long trajectory and history of uh, communist uh, study classes and teachings in the state that has translated these concepts into local vernacular languages so the first argument i also tried to uh, put forward in here is the way in which the local green movement act actively adopts marxian understanding of class struggle into their uh, protest vocabularies the quotation i've seen on shown on the screen clearly shows how which is from a pamphlet developed by the local green movement called peria anti pollution campaign in 2018 the first sentence read the capitalist forces that plunder soil water and all natural resources to reap profits threaten the survival of human beings and our nature marx and engels actively question the invasion of nature by human beings 
So they say to believe that environmental conservation does not form part of the class struggle would be, you know, something that would embolden and aid the capitalist forces. So the green movement that we are considering here is highly Marxist in terms of their orientation, ideological affiliation and interpretation of what is happening in terms of the environmental grievance that they're encountering. The image on your screen shows the decisive effect of pollution that uh, makes the river run in two different colors on two stretches alongside the industrial hub. And it's equally interesting to see how the two social movements, both the trade unions and the local green movements, invoke the interest of workers to legitimize their movement claims. For example, the local green movement says whatever they are standing for or the fight against pollution is also a fight to secure the lives and livelihoods of inland fish workers and farm workers. Again, it is important to note these are two categories of workers who are located in the informal sector of Indian economy. So they... The highlighted section again shows the circumstances prevent these workers from selling their labor power. Again, very Marxian in terms of the interpretation of what is happening to these workers. A fish worker going to the river catch fish is, is returning barehanded. He's not getting enough fish to catch. It clearly highlights how the conditions, the destruction of the conditions of production affects uh, the everyday living and livelihood of a worker who is resource dependent and located in the primary sector of the economy. If you look at the industrial workers and the union collective, again, you can see how they invoke the interest of factory workers to legitimize their movement claims. They say the invocation of pollution as a reason for closing down industries is costing you know, the jobs and daily bread and butter of the factory workers. So again, the situatedness of the industrial workers within the system of industrial capitalism creates a formation of socially organized uh, idea of denial of pollution in favor of securing the everyday uh, life and uh, livelihood of the factory workers. So here you can see jobs operating as a form of blackmail mechanism where workers are used often as protectors of industries by engaging in or actively recruiting workers from, uh, from the local region. Industries often use these workers in the front line of struggle against local environmentalism and further creating a, a, a kind of schism between local green movements and environmental movements. To conclude, and I think I'm slightly over my time, so it's, it's important to understand why do they fail to form an alliance. And it's clear that it, it would be a mistake to understand working class as a homogeneous category. The competing interest, uh, working class interest, as explained by the inland fish workers and farm workers, and subsequently by the factory workers, show how sectoral location, the extent of dependence on natural resources, and vulnerability to environmental damages create distinctly different and opposing interest. And sometimes it would be overlapping, but many attempts it's at odds with each other. And it should be understood to, it should be explored to understand why they are at odds with each other. And it is even more important for the union movement to consider working class, not just as workers in the factory shop floor, but move beyond the factory shop floor to include workers who are at the vagaries of capitalism uh, and its destruction of the conditions of production. Just it's important to understand and acknowledge the heterogeneity of working class interests for mobilization. And finally, it's, a, it's an invitation uh, for more inquiries to understand how institutionalized trade unions often affect unions' relationship with other progressive social movements, despite having similar class interests, despite having similar ideological orientation. How do they still end up uh, being at odds against each other rather than fighting uh, or joining hands in fighting industrial capitalism? Yeah, with that note, I'm, I'm concluding mine. Thank you. Thank you, Silpa. Um, our next uh, perspective comes from Brazil. Um, and uh, our speaker is Diego Azi, uh, the, from the Professor of International Relations at the Federal University of the ABC uh, in the greater Sao Paulo. Uh, the title of his, his chapter in the volume was Trade Union Politics for a Just Transition Towards Consensus or Dissensus? Question mark. Diego. Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, I also want to begin uh, by thanking uh, Nora, David, and Dimitris for the invitation to take part in this uh, handbook. It's been an exciting journey. Uh, and I think that the book has uh, resulted in a very rich uh, compendium of perspectives on environmental labor issues that show that uh, it's still a complex issue with a long way to go. Uh, anyhow, uh, I won't present uh, my PowerPoint 
uh, file here because it's not as pretty as Surplus. So uh, I'm getting a bit shy of presenting it. Nevertheless, I do have a sort of a guide for uh, commenting a summary on what I've tried to present with my chapter, right? So I focus on the international trade union movement um, actions concerning trade, uh, concerning just transition, right? And uh, I do that by examining three, what I've called three mutually constituted tires, uh, which we could call also three different levels of analysis, right? So I work with the idea idea of an intra-union level, an extra-union level, and a union plus level of analysis or dimension of trade union action, which means that in the intra-union level, we are talking about unions in their own uh, universe. In the extra-union level, we talk about uh, the relations of unions towards the States towards business organizations, international organizations, financial financial institutions, and so on. Uh, and in the Union Plus tire, we talk about the engagement of unions with environmental movements, organizations, civil society organizations in general, alliance building, and uh, uh, concerns uh, from unions towards uh, society in a broader sense, right? Uh, so, um, in order to understand trade union approach to just transition in these three dimensions, uh, I share or I um, build upon the power resource analysis uh, developed by Stefan Schmaus, uh, Michael Fischer and others, in which uh, they highlight uh, different kinds of trade union power, right? Uh, which are related also to different dimensions uh, of trade union life or trade union action. So we have structural power, associative power, social power, and institutional power. Right? What I've tried to do in my chapter is to correlate these different uh, kinds of trade union power to the trade union action uh, for a just transition in those three different levels of analysis, right? And uh, I mean, a, a basic um, background presupposition for my analysis is that the climate crisis itself has provided um, a uh, increasing and continuous political structure of opportunities uh, for progressive social forces, uh, including progressive trade unions, uh, political parties, social movements, and NGOs, etc., um, to build and promote a renewed uh, critique of business as usual capitalist exploitation, making the links between uh, the exploitation of human labor force and nature as well. So uh, the trade union movement at the international level has managed to take part in uh, this new political structure of opportunities provided by uh, continuous climate and just transition negotiations, events, uh, trade union initiatives at all three levels of analysis. And uh, in my chapter, I um, conclude the discussion um, arguing that a dissensus driven just transition perspective uh, has a close link with the relation of trade unions to the union plus tire uh, of trade union activity and the enhancement of trade unions social power, right? Um, we'll get back to that. So, um, the just transition concept is actually not uh, exactly a new concept for trade unions, uh, which means in the intra-union tire, right? Uh, what's being new about the just transition concept uh, nowadays is that this narrative has reached a wi much wider public uh, audience, uh, reaching relevant political actors as well as private corporate actors in the in what I've called the extra union tire. And that's to say that also the concept of just transition has been uh, appropriated by different actors with 
different meanings, right? So what was originally a bridge for trade unions to engage with uh, environmental, environmental discussions and climate negotiations quickly became sort of a buzzword that uh, served different identities and different actors. So that's uh, a little bit um, in the background of my worries uh, about the, the idea of a just transition. I mean, is just transition a false solution as social movements uh, often critique it? Or is just transition a tool for social struggle uh, in a tool for a different engagement between the labor the labor movement and the whole environment and uh, climate debates, right? Uh, which means that trade unions discussing environment, climate, and a just transition are also uh, themselves changing their trade union culture, their trade union identity, what uh, French philosopher Jacques Rancière calls the political modes of subjectivation through which political actors constitute themselves uh, in their identities, right? So uh, it's important to understand that for, uh, for trade unions and labor in general, it's very tough to uh, discuss these issues without reviewing their own identities and uh, uh, political culture. And that, that's why uh, also the just transition uh, proposition, thank you, Scott, um, is also um, very differently understood and has uh, different uh, presence when we take a look at the international level and then when we go down to the regional level, to the national level and to the local level of trade union activity. And um, I, I, in my uh, chapter, I discuss how um especially from a top-down perspective that means from the international to the local uh, trade union strategy for a just transition has been uh, much more consensual than dissensual in the sense that um, trade unions have uh, tried to cooperate with the private sector and governments towards sort of a win-win agenda uh, through social dialogue um, basically referring to a northern uh, specific reality of trade unionism, uh, which is by no means uh, verifiable in other places in the world, which uh, highlights uh, a difficulty in strategy from unions uh, to bring down the discussion from the international forums of uh, specialized uh, trade unionists engaging with the UN system or whatever to the concrete uh, national collective bargaining agreements that take place uh, in the global south, for example. Uh, I can mention just one, one data for you guys. Uh, I was recently in a seminar with oil workers from Brazil and uh, one of them said that uh, only 2% of national collective bargaining agreements made by the Oil Workers Federation had environmental components attached to them, not to mention just transition policies once. So it's still very far from the, uh, let's say, uh, grassroots trade unionism uh, negotiations that uh, take place uh, in, the, in the global south. Uh, and just to, I'm uh, sorry to, to rush a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, in my chapter, I uh, sort of uh, developed the argument that the, the census-driven version of trade union action for a just transition is more likely to take place precisely when they are allied or in uh, coordinated action with other social actors in the union plus tire, enhancing thus the social power of unions towards younger generations, towards civil society organizations and other social movements, because then it shows that trade unions are not acting in a corporatist uh, kind of agenda, which is what uh, trade unions are frequently accused of. Uh, nevertheless, the mainstream just transition strategy by trade unions so far uh, emphasizes the more uh, consensus-driven uh, institutional power strategy uh, of social social dialogue and uh, pledges for the private sector and the states to 
uh, actually uh, think about and take care of the workers in the polluting industry. So uh, trade unions are still more uh, in a consensual transactional approach to just transition uh, rather than um, investing in a more critical dissensus driven approach that could bring them closer to other civil society actors uh, and thus enhancing trade union social power. So that's it to summarize, very tough task. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Diego. Uh, and thanks to both of the first two speakers uh, uh, on the time front for allowing us plenty of time for Q&A. Um, our third speaker is Camila, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your last name, Holland. Wonderful. Did I get it? Did I get close? <laughs> Very <laughs> um, uh, uh, The title of her chapter, which brings us a perspective from Af research in Africa, is Labor Resistance Against Fossil Fuel Subsidies Reform, uh, Neoliberal Discourses and African Realities. Uh, Camila? Can you see this now? Can you yes, see my, sir. okay, good. Yeah. Because now I can't see you, but I see my presentation. Good, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you both to the organizers in, uh, in Brazil and to the editors, both for allowing me to have my chapter in what looks like a fantastic book. I just got it now on Friday. And, uh, and uh, to inviting me for this seminar. Uh, the title, as Scott said, is Labour Resistance Against Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform, Neoliberal Discourses and African Realities, or in short, uh, the Global and Class Inequalities of Subsidy Reform, which I have also used as another title for this. Um, as you may be aware, there is a fossil fuel issue in the world connected to, to global climate change and there is enormous subsidies linked to the fossil industries and uh, the, the references here on, uh, on the right is from different articles from The Guardian showing some of the staggering numbers of, of five trillion dollars per year in, in subsidies uh, and 11 million dollars a minute of subsidies uh, and a reference to uh, one of the, the biggest books about the subject of fossil fuel subsidies stating that they strain public budgets and contribute to climate change and local air pollution. And despite widespread agreement among experts about the benefits of reforming subsidies, repeated international commitments to eliminate them and valiant efforts by some countries to reform them, the subsidies resist. The same authors identify one of the key challenges for reform is so-called public protest. And we've seen public protest against fuel subsidy reform also in Brazil. Uh, the latest I know is in Kazakhstan in February this year uh, and basically all over the world and particularly strong in the global south uh, and in, uh, in uh, oil countries. And in light of these uh, agreement among experts referred to in the in the previous uh, slide, it may seem like a paradox or even a contradiction that poor people and labor who tends to lead many of these protests uh, do so to, to resist subsidy reforms. Uh, and uh, the famous uh, economist Paul Collier in 2012, when the Nigerians went to the street, said that the, the protest resembled the sad folly of the Tea Party movement with poor people tricked into lobbying for greedy elites. So my chapter has looked further into the, the 
policy, reform policies, where they come from, the discourses and the arguments, but also looked into the practical realities globally and specifically in, in uh, African countries. And I have spent 10 years doing research in Nigeria, centering around uh, subsidy reforms. And I've done interviews with uh, different actors and protesters, and particularly with labor. And for this chapter, I also uh, added interviews with labor uh, activists in Sudan, Ghana, and Zimbabwe. Uh, the first and overall insight is when we look into these numbers, um, one thing is that defining these fuel subsidies, particularly as a problem for climate change, has been linked to a G20 meeting in 2009, uh, voiced particularly by Barack Obama, the president of the US at the time. Uh, then they define fuel subsidies as different kind of forms for support for production or consumption of fuel subsidies in the form of taxes or direct payment to, to distribute cheaper fuel for, for consumers. If you look into the practice, after 10 years of trying or, or at least saying they would reform, G20 and other rich oil uh, countries tend to not reduce their production subsidies. In fact, the US during the COVID crisis last year added $50 million to production to their own uh, oil companies. Uh, and my own country, Norway, they're not part of G the G20, but a non non-G20 group of Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform added uh, a stimulus package uh, in 2020 for the oil industry, which is supposed to be around $1 trillion uh, worth of support in tax reform or tax exemptions for the oil industry. Uh, and meanwhile, the same actors through the IMF and the World Bank and through their aid politics has pushed for consumption subsidy reform, which primarily happens in the global south. And this was also forcefully uh, shown in the UNDP campaign just before the, the, the COP26 uh, in November last year, where they had a campaign with this dinosaur turning up in at the UN Security Council, uh, urging countries not to distinct themselves or extinct themselves uh, through continued subsidizing fossil fuel. And as you see the highlight here, the UNDP explicitly refers only to consumption and not production. So, that's the first kind of big issue. So when we move into the case studies, I'm, I'm not able to go into detail in the countries, but I looked into Sudan, and you may remember the, the revolution in 2018, which actually pushed the dictator al-Bashir to step down. That was triggered by subsidy reforms where they removed food and fuel subsidies. In 2012, there was uh, maybe the biggest protest in terms of numbers in Nigerian history, potentially also in, in, in Africa with millions of people uh, turning into the streets and even more people getting away from work. And in Ghana in 2016 and in Zimbabwe in 2019, there were similar protests. What all these countries have in common is weak uh, governance systems and weak trust systems in, in their own country. Uh, two of them are heavily oil dependent countries, Sudan and Nigeria, and Ghana also has significant oil. Uh, when talking to, to oil workers, the 
uh, compared to, to what the, the mainstream arguments and discourses uh, about fuel subsidy is first that uh, whereas in, in the global north and in, in the, the academic literature as well as in the World Bank, IMF, the International Energy Agency, you name it, a lot of, of uh, north-based global institutions, the idea that this is about climate change is not at all recognized when you move down to individual countries in Africa. Uh, whereas the Sudanese said that they had at some point discussed climate change, uh, all of them say that the, the removal of subsidy is an austerity issue. It's uh, climate change is generally not presented. I also don't think it was presented in in uh, in Brazil in 2019 or in uh, in Ecuador in 2019. It's linked to IMF and austerity measures, and it's about saving money from the state. It's not about reallocation from subsidies to other issues. Uh, and it's also historically linked back to the structural adjustment programs from the 1980s and 1990s. And it's very explicitly associated with um, these packages that uh, shrunk the state, depoliticized the state, it removed welfare, it cut jobs, and it challenged labor rights. So the association of these packages has nothing to do with climate change and all to do about losing rights and opportunities and increased poverty. Furthermore, it has been linked to, to different waves of, of anti-austerity protests and democracy struggle. So these issues have explicitly been interlinked by labor and labor has built uh, in, a, in a time where they lost associational power with direct members losing their jobs, they gained associational power through social mobilization of non-labor actors in, in social alliances. And they also built institutional power, especially in Nigeria, through regular protests over fuel subsidies. Uh, whereas the, the general or, or neoliberal discourse about the subsidies that it's like, like the reference to, to um, Paul Collier above, uh, that this is primarily something for the rich because the rich people consume more oil, therefore it doesn't make sense for the workers to protest. The, the response to this is that maybe they consume more, but for poor people and workers in general, it affects them harder. And the, the, the increase in fuel prices have immediate effects on prices of ba basic goods and services, including transport, medicine and food. And thus it worsened the impact in in countries that are already in in uh, dire economic situations i see my time is running out so i'll quickly say also that uh, the the discourses globally is that there should be savings from from uh, cutting fuel subsidies that has taken up a big chunk of of national budgets However, in practice, this is one budget cuts, not about reallocation. Uh, and, and there's a lack of trust in governments. Like the picture here is from the uh, Nigerian workers who went to court. And these are workers in a specific um, pro-poor initiative where money from subsidies should be spent on, on welfare for workers, and these workers simply didn't weren't paid, so they had to, to go to court. 
Uh, secondly, there's also an cl internal class issue that where uh, oil workers in Nigeria support the argument that the subsidy hinders investment and job creation in the formal downstream sector. But the main story is that jobs are lost when prices increase, especially in informal and small business sectors and in agriculture. Uh, the unions also emphasize that there is no opting out of fuel dependency for the alternatives are either not there, though the vice president of uh, Nigeria is here demonstrating an electronic car, but with the energy poverty and lack of electricity, it's not really an option in general or for the poor people, they cannot afford an, an electric car. Um, so uh, a quick summary is um, that this is in many ways um, climate change being imposed on an old neoliberal austerity agenda that doesn't do much good for labor. Uh, and in the bigger picture, it also says something about labor and climate where, where the issue of nature goes beyond the traditional idea of jobs versus the environment. Uh, enforcing us to think about workers not only as producers in the fossil industry, but also uh, dependence of energy consumption. I see if I can find you back now. There. Thank you, Camila. Um, Thank you. Well, now we will have a, a, an opportunity for you to place your uh, questions in the chat. And we already have some questions from Katusha and Lucas. But first, I'd like to give our, uh, we've got two of the three co-editors of the volume uh, present here uh, in Dimitris and David. Would you like to uh, say a few words each before we what, open things why up? Why don't we just? Why, uh, Scott, why don't we just have the uh, question and answer, and then if time allows, uh, David, Nora, and I can uh, say a few things, because we don't want to take away from the the, que the question and answer. Thanks. Okay. Um, and Katusha, how much time should uh, uh, do should we allow? Well, In feel free of... to let people um, say what they want to say uh, by the time they want to take. Um, well, as we're, I don't know if you, you have gathered any questions on your end um, from, uh, from the other feed, but uh, I will pose uh, the questions that we have so far from, from uh, the, uh, the chat and uh, give the authors a chance to respond. Katusha posed questions to, to both um, uh, to two of our speakers, to Diego and to Silpa. Um, question about Brazil, uh, or still by, um, or met, uh, referencing Brazil, the difference between, uh, institutionalized left oriented and bread and butter unions, um, is, is that a, uh, distinction that resonates with, um, with, with India's experience and how might that affect the labor environment nexus there? And, um, or Diego, um, uh, uh, the uh, question about coalition between labor movements and other social movements, women's, uh, indigenous, uh, and that to some extent uh, dovetails with the uh, question that Lucas had posed about the impact on just tr transition from uh, indigenous communities, labor alternatives perspective. So uh, perhaps we should go in the uh, are there any additional questions that you've gathered, Katusha and Ricardo? Yes, sure. That's a good idea. Um, well, shall we uh, give an initial round of responses from our? We'll go in the order um, of our speakers. So, begin with Silpa. Sure, sure. Thanks for the question, Kat. So. Um, I think it's very similar. You cannot say that's an either or condition where there are institutionalized unions versus bread and butter. Maybe that the trajectory is the other way where they started off 
with a very strong revolutionary radical orientation uh, during the early part of trade union movement in the state of Kerala with a very strong class struggle against capitalism. So it was a militant trade union movement during the initial years. However, during the 1980s, there was a shift in class politics where the where it shifted from a politics of class struggle to that of class compromise, where also the mainstream unions, which have strong affiliation to political parties, decided to engage in a relationship of compromise with industrial capital to facilitate the state's uh, you know, growth path or trajectory in that sense. So there has been a clear shift, like you hinted at, from very radical to a more reformist kind of idea and a, a more institutionalized a form of union in that because they had more access to centers of power. The party affiliation helped them have access to, you know, the state legislature in terms of making laws, etc. So yes, it has been a trajectory, but the either or part is still there because not there is a, a diverse uh, orientation or you cannot call leftist as one homogeneous group in the state of Kerala. Even there are uh, from center to extreme uh, left, there are different variants of uh, varying intensities in which they hold on to these leftist ideas. So there are still very radical uh, trade unions. However, the constituent or membership of these radical groups are pretty small when compared to mainstream unions that have affiliation to political parties, if, if I'm making sense. Thanks. Diego? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, well, of course, I will respond with information I have. Uh, so as much as I know, uh, we, ac we actually do not have a proper uh, coalition for just transition, specifically built to push forward a just transition agenda uh, in Brazil, especially at the national level um, amongst the national trade union centers or uh, industry branches things like that but um, the other day during cop 26 in glasgow I, I was not there but i took part in a online panel and uh, i was saying uh, that uh, it was interesting because in brazil in my view we have sort of a paradox uh, because Amongst the labor movement and in the dialogue between the labor movement and environmental and social movements and organizations, we are probably leaving uh, one of the most mature phases uh, of this uh, reflection on uh, labor environment uh, contradictions, divisions, or potential alliances, and so on. But at the same time, uh, at the uh, public policy level, we have probably never been so far from sustainable development uh, in the past 10 years uh, than we are now, right? So uh, it's tough to acknowledge that uh, in Brazil, uh, even uh, before the COVID pandemic, uh, before the war in Ukraine and so on, uh, there was no transition going on actually. Uh, and as well as the whole sustainable development goals agenda, the, there was no progress with that whatsoever. So it's, it's, I think it's also important to uh, reflect on the fact that especially in the global south it's tough to talk about a just transition when you have not even a transition going on right so um as far as i see uh in brazil we have seen in the past years uh the formation or the strengthening of a multiplicity of environmental and climate justice groups and networks but they are not related to just transition specifically, right? Uh, in Brazil, as far as my experience, uh, the just transition agenda is still pushed forward by the trade union movement, by a part of the trade union movement, an important part, uh, mainly by CUT and uh, the trade union confederations of the Americas, which is ITUC's Americas branch. Um, but that's it, right? There, there is no just transition debate uh, 
uh, really uh, going on. However, um, trade unions have engaged with other environmental and social actors in um, some interesting networks. I will mention two that might be of your interest, interest for further research. One is called the Labor and Peasant uh, Energy and Water Platform, right? Which is a collective of uh, union and non-union organizations dealing mainly with energy issues. So we have the uh, movement of affected by dams, movement of affected by mining and other kinds of social movements together with unions there. And the other is called uh, Carta de Belém group. is a group uh, actually that focus on uh, environmental and climate negotiations. It, they were created during the World Social Forum 2009 in the city of Belém, hence their name. And um, they also include different unions and non-union uh, groups dealing with these issues and the uh, CUT is also involved in it. And just to, to wrap up, I think that one final element that uh, is very important for uh, Global South organizations, which is uh, democracy, right, it has to be taken into consideration when debating just transition because uh, one of the basic pillars of the idea of just transition is a democratic dialogue between social actors. And uh, in the Global South, uh, very frequently, uh, we do not verify that minimum condition. So uh, yeah, that's it, thanks. Thanks, Diego. Uh, Camila, you may have seen in the chat that there was an additional question posed to uh, to you from uh, Mateus about uh, how optimistic one can be about the uh, just transition in light of, particularly in light of the uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, the pandemic as well as the uh, Ukraine war. Um, and certainly thinking about that in, uh, in the United, from the United States perspective, just adding my own uh, thought to that, we see how it emboldens the um, the energy industry uh, to lobby for more more production, and the discourse of energy independence becomes much stronger, and it, it really uh, uh, creates difficulties for for pushing forward the climate change agenda on the part of the administration and and its uh, and its allies. And I'm sure that we see similar dynamics probably unfolding. Uh, in other countries around the world. Plus for the Global South, we have to think about how this is raising food prices, uh, particularly for grains, for many food importing countries in Africa uh, among them. So just thoughts on any of that? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was trying to read and listen at the same time, so sorry if I, if I lost it. I, if I'm an optimist, that's um, I'm personally generally an optimist struggling currently. I think it's in, in the current <laughs> times it's ex it's extremely difficult, and I think for us as researchers, it's it also calls for us to to look for for opportunities like both my my colleague and presenters looking for for potential for social alliances and different kind of, of political interest between different social movements and i think there are even even in my country where oil workers have been seen as part of this oil industry uh, calling for increased subsidies and support for the oil industry the workers themselves have actually been asking for in in terms of this just transition and and democratic processes whereas the the trade unions asks for a social partners advisory council for just transition for workers only and not including the environmental movement there are bottom up 
asking even from the oil workers saying that is conservative and reactionary we need the environmental movements to come on board and we also see in nigeria there have been cases of of joint efforts between oil workers and an environmental even though in a very sporadic and, <laughs> and small but i i think there's also a need for opening up those common interests and and that's if if i can also hint at, at silpa and ask a question because your approach to these two different movements have been through trying to understand their commonalities in class uh, but i have not yet written but i have talked to nigerian workers and environmental actors on on how they experience environmental changes, especially concerning their health. And my impression is that the workers describe a devastating and horrible uh, health situation where they also feel extremely disempowered, but also with a lack of technical knowledge and capacity to do anything about it. So, so there also seems to be very concrete physical common interests albeit understanding that even the oil workers say we cannot do anything about it and we need that salary so so but but to try to be optimistic in in finding those openings of commonalities and maybe even breaking for instance the bonds between oil workers and the oil industry uh, and there, there's a movement here in Norway who, now, who kind of tries to push that agenda by pointing to the industry, like you said, Scott, they get a lot of money, but they're also very mobile. They can take away their capital and move into another industry when the green transition comes and the, and the fossil industry no longer yields, if you, if you may whereas the workers are not as mobile and, and will have different interests. So trying to understand when and how there are common and different interests between classes. And, uh, and yeah, so that's somehow a hopefully optimistic. There's a lot of work need to be done. Uh, the, the question on the, the subsidy, if they exist in Nigeria, the slogan is there is no subsidy. Partly because most of the the third uh, uh, part of of, um, of the state budgets that so called go to subsidy are in fact corruption, so uh, so they will say no, there's no such thing. And the numbers that you refer to here with the 5.2 trillion uh, referring to externalities that depends on what we want to. From a climate perspective, I think it's it's an important point to say that we have cost from the fossil industry and its uh, its uh, emissions that concerns our health accidents etc cetera, etc cetera. and it has social cost way beyond the the direct cost of subsidy however it's absurd when it's compared to how we count any other kind of cost so so it's it's inflated and and yeah so i don't know if that's an answer uh, Silpa, would you like to respond to Camila's um, uh, question or comment post uh, directed at you before we go to our uh, our co-editors? I think it makes a lot more sense how Camila was framing the health impacts of workers, and despite you know being the most affected, I think I could see uh, similarities in in the region I worked at because. Most of these are chemical industries, so there are occupational health hazards. But still, again, you know, being being vulnerable and situated in a, in an industrial hub, and this being the only source of employment, again puts them uh, in a very uh, delicate position to be able to negotiate with capital in any form or manner, right? So that's why I think this agenda for just transition and a strong state in that sense becomes all the more important to provide an avenue to transition outside of this polluting industry without. Uh, causing a lot of harm to the workers. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be excited to know more about, you know, how health also intersect into this larger scheme of inequalities. Absolutely. I don't know if I answered it uh, uh, reasonably. Yeah, thanks. 
Uh, Nora, David, or Demetrius, would any of you like to uh, say a few words at this juncture? Your mic's moot. Of course. Sorry, I was muted. I always forget to unmute. And uh, by the way, mute and unmute, the people who are frozen on the screen, if you switch your camera off and then on, you will be moving again. Because three of you are frozen. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Hi. So I have a question, I think, to everybody, which uh, I don't have the answer to, and maybe that's the best way of posing a question, is, uh, you know, in this thick book that we have here, um, many of, I think, the majority of the authors, and also we as editors, we're always looking at the way in which transformative environmental practices and policies are really also transformative in terms of transforming capitalist relations of production, because we can see that those capitalist relations of production, you know, are the ones that really hinder us to transform uh, production and consumption in a way that cares for nature. On the other hand, what I'm worrying about is that we don't have time we're not going to get rid of capitalism and then there will be a green transformation. So do we not have to shift or maybe just add to our perspective whether environmental policies are uh, transformative in terms of transformative of the society, add to that or yeah, add to that or embolden that with the question, how successful are environmental practices in terms of really getting rid of fossil fuels, uh, preserving biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Because we're not just in a climate crisis, we are in a crisis of life because everywhere everything is breaking down. So... Do we have to shift our perspective a little bit because we? it's great if the policies are socially transformative, but sometimes they're socially transformative, but not really environmentally transformative. And we have so many conflicts between workers, as you have all uh, addressed, you know, all the three talks. Like, for instance, in the case of India, and then I'm stopping, because, uh, for instance, in the case of India, when you look at these two workers' movements, both of them are actually doing the same thing. They are fighting for their own jobs, you know, they're fighting for their own livelihoods and their own survival. Only that they're in their survival, they are um, conflicting of each other, you know, each other's needs of survival conflicts with the need of survival of the other. So I think that is such a big conflict that we also see in other um, analysis of worker environmentalism. So one of the main questions may be, how can we overcome that kind of conflicts of interest that are very real and very existential? Thank you, Nora. Uh, Dimitris uh, and David, would you like to say anything before we uh, go back to our panelists? Sure, David. Okay, while we're waiting for David, yeah, I do. Um, I want to say two things. Okay. Are you ready, David? Or okay. I, I want to say two things, which are the product of all this whole process with the handbook and then the webinars. Um, and the rest of you know the work that we have all been doing is uh, about the fact that even though just transition may not be in some places in some parts of the world, including in the United States, the most popular or realistic, still there is a lot of research and practice to do with respect to labor environmentalism and even more broadly environmental labor. Science. And I think that uh, we can learn a lot and we can practice a lot uh, beyond just 
transition. But the other thing that has been on my mind, uh, and I think that your presentations, all three of you today, made very, very clear, is how do we recognize that in the world there is international inequality, uh, some incredible evidence from Oxfam, from uh, uh, Piketty's uh, lab in Paris, uh, and also intra inequality. I mean, not only between North and South, but within the North and within the South. For instance, that in the last 30 years, uh, emissions in the global North have increased for the richer, while they have declined. They have declined for the bottom, some 50 or 60 percent. Well, it's just incredible, right? The same thing in the global South, of course. And one of the things that becomes apparent is how um, uh, hegemonic relations work uh, across global levels. Um, and one of the things that became apparent in your presentations is, is the power of job and access blackmail. That is how capital, empowered by the rules of the political economy, can in fact very simply say we're moving. We are moving or we are taking away what uh, we were quote unquote providing, whether that's no subsidies or subsidies or employment, not only for workers, but for communities. And to go back to some of this, something that Sipa said, that has, you know, the, that power of capital just touches everything, not just workers. And so I'm just wondering, how do we think about it? And how do we think about it in terms uh, that it includes whole global production ne networks, the uh, global divisions of labor, if you wish, and we can move beyond an aggregate global north, global south, because those kinds of black mates, that kind of exercise of power is really extraordinary in the global north and breeds, as we all know, throughout the world, nativism and nationalism and all kinds of other horrible uh, and divisive um, influences. So your presentations provided me at least with a lot of thinking about that. Thanks. Uh, David, okay. Um, would you like? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can, you can hear me. Good. <clears throat> I think what I've really uh, valued from these presentations that they, um, they've been theorizing work and nature, uh, work and nature relationships in a globalized context, and so often that isn't isn't the case. But I'm going to make. I think three points I'd like to make. Um, in the handbook, we were keen to emphasize that when discussing the catastrophes that result um, as a consequence of climate change and the despoilation of the environment and natural environments, it's very easy to put workers, their families and the communities in the position of victims of such changes and catastrophes. But it seems to me that if the just transition movement is to mean anything at all, it is that workers should be seen as agents of constructive change, that with their participation, skills, knowledge, creativity and commitment to the future, they are an essential part of the solution, not just collateral damage from the problem. And I think we need to have much more research on that, not just a question of wringing our hands and saying, isn't it terrible that workers are suffering? I think we've actually got to get beyond that now. We know that. Next point I think I'd like to make is that um, I want to make an observation that, was, that seemed to me very relevant in the first webinar on extractive industries, but I think it's no less relevant to, uh, here today from some of the presentations that I've heard. Um, decisions about the environment, um, decisions that have damaging consequences on the environment, communities and workers who live and work there, are often not made in the place where the environment is affected. And I think it's very important to bear that difference in mind. Those decisions that affect the destruction of the environment may be on the, on the other part and the other side of the world. Now, I think all these webinars have demonstrated that there's a need for 
a dialogue between Labour working in the global north and the global south, and that's certainly come up today. But to that I would also add there's a need for a dialogue between researchers working in the global north and the global south. And I think um, uh, Camilla's paper and her research is a good example of that. The final point I'd like to make is that, the, for me, the richness of environmental labour studies was very much borne out by these, by the papers this afternoon. Their richness in terms of methodology and in terms of their analysis, but also in terms of being part of an interdisciplinary dialogue. Environmental labour studies is not the concern of a single discipline. It needs many dis different disciplines to come together and share their perspectives and insights. And I think that's been amply uh, demonstrated both today and over the previous four or uh, three webinars. Thank you very much. So shall we have a last round of um, uh, replies to any of the, uh, the commentary of the editors or anything else from our three presenters? And we do have uh, one additional question from, from the chat, also from uh, Mateus about the provocative example of, of China, uh, the country that seems to be the most dynamic in reducing poverty. Uh, in the last few decades, yet being the largest uh, uh, polluter and, and contributor to greenhouse gases in terms of rates of change, I believe, uh, in recent decades, as well with its rapid industrialization, does that pose a real challenge to the notion that it's uh, uh, that there's uh, that 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 there are synergies and that it's not it's sort of a trade-off, uh, a zero-sum game, if you will. Um, Shall we begin with Silpa? Yeah, I'd like to sum up by broadly responding uh, to, to some of the points raised by the editors. I think Nora mentioned about the, the problematics of when workers are at odds with each other and how can we then fathom forming a coalition of some form or some shape. And what worries me the most is even when um, even when the state or the, the power is in the hands of leftist parties, the ideology of economic growth is still very dominant. So if, if you envision achieving more growth as your path towards securing some of the basic development indicators, mostly in the context of countries in the global south, I think it would be a, a harder battle to fight in terms of getting consensus in terms of you know, uh, shifting away from this rapid path towards achieving more economic growth, building more infrastructure and industrialization as this path towards uh, securing some of these things. So I am really at loss in terms of uh, engaging in a dialogue where you have to get past this you know, obsession with or hegemony that economic growth as a concept enjoys, even in erstwhile progressive societies that did not appreciate growth so much. And I think in, when you come or look at climate change, countries in the global south still uh, engage in a strong debate around surrounding historic emissions and what has been done in the global north and many of the structural problems such as poverty, rapid unemployment, large scale, uh, you know, structural inequalities that some of these societies um, struggle with, which is a valid concern. So that also is a, is a huge challenge in terms of both parties in the left and, and left and center in terms of building a consensus in terms of uh, forming more sustainable ways of economic growth and development. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, it's it's a challenging thing, especially uh, uh, given the nationalist, uh, the obsession with uh, ultra-nationalist movements in countries like India. It would also be a mistake to critique this panacea that Kerala has maintained in terms of uh, having strong welfareist orientation. So I'm, I'm extremely conscious about uh, not extremely being critical of this particular state of Kerala, which at least preserve some sense of uh, forming a descent or you know there is a there is a platform for at least engaging in some form of a descending voice without uh, worry of being punished or penalized by the state so it's it's a complicated equation like dimitris is saying you know and it's not it's there is no one size fits all solution but it's it's becoming harder i would say uh, to to solve this problem given the other myriad challenges posed by nationalism and many other 
tropes associated with that. that that's where I would end. Thanks. Thank you, Silpa. Uh, Diego? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the questions and comments. <clears throat> of course, I have no answer to them. Uh, I'll just try to comment back. Uh, but uh, I think that um, concerning uh, Nora's comments, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to predict course but um, climate climate crisis and the environmental crisis is also a threat to capitalism itself so I think that we we are not witnessing it yet as of today but I'm quite convinced that uh, there will be a systemic way out of the ecological crisis right there will be a uh, green capitalist transformation that will prevent uh, us from destroying the planet at the same time uh, preventing the system from collapsing on its own foot right but um, that doesn't mean as you're saying that this transformation this ecological transformation will also be uh, so a social transformation towards a more just society, right? Or towards different uh, relations of production, um, different property relations, who knows, right? Uh, and uh, you're totally right uh, to point out that these two transitions do not go along uh, necessarily at the same time and at the same pace, right? And one thing that um, I find uh, challenging about the whole transition and sustainability debate is that um, we have been witnessing for the past, I don't know, 30 to 40 years, a continuous erosion of labor rights and social rights and, you know, <laughs> pension reforms. And they are, they're all regressive reforms, right? Uh, so, uh, my my feeling is that uh, when we talk about just transition, uh, we will lack the justice part of the transition. After all, in in real life, right? Um, and that uh, still, even uh, within the framework of a green capitalism or a sus more sustainable capitalism, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the labor capital contradictions and tensions will remain the same. So uh, this, this is often uh, pointed out when uh, we frequently are rem reminded that sometimes uh, when we transition from polluting industries to uh, renewables industries, the labor rights and labor conditions are worse in the renewables than <laughs> in the polluting industries. And uh, that has also a relation to which um, uh, Dimitris was saying about the uh, capital mobility versus labor immobility, which is a uh, problem of uh, trade union organization concerning just transition, because uh, in many countries, and I, I would risk saying that in all countries, uh, polluting industries uh, represent some of our most powerful national centers or uh, trade union branches, I don't know. Uh, so when you transition those workers from polluting industries to sustainable industries, what do you do with the trade union representation? It's not an automatic process of transferring the labor representation together with uh, the job position. So, uh, and it seems that the international labor movement has not figured out uh, yet a formula for that uh, because we risk uh, transitioning very powerful unions in polluting industries to very uh, flexible, precarized, uh, rightless uh, job posts in renewable industries. So uh, that's that's a, a challenge for a workers' organization. And I, I think it has to do also concerning uh, David's uh, comment. Um, 
about workers being victims or agents, right? Um, and part of the solution. I think that uh, uh, the problem is that uh, as the pandemic has shown, uh, we have, we do not have a labor centered economy no longer, right? And uh, the pandemic has highlighted those very uh, strategic uh, human resource intense labor sectors that we cannot live without, right? Uh, and I think that part of the, the, the solution for the, the, the climate crisis, the environmental crisis and the sustainability challenge that we have is uh, recovering that idea of recentering the economy around labor. And uh, not only industrial, traditional, uh, old white men labor, right? Uh, but also the care economy and I mean, all, all the informal uh, sectors of the economy, which today prevail over the formal economy and the formal <laughs> represented labor force, right? So, um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. I'll jump in then. Um, thank you for comments and um, I'll try not to repeat what has been said already. Uh, I want to I start with David's comment on, on whether workers are victims or agents of constructive change. I think it's extremely important to understand and, the, and, and not romanticize what's workers. Workers can also be agents of uh, whatever is and preserving and being conservative. And, and Milton Berger's book on, on how oil workers in different oil countries, including my own, has been an extremely powerful force of, of uh, continued practices of a petroleum dependent economy. And as Diego mentioned, oil workers are relatively powerful, uh, especially in Norway. Uh, and and can as much be a, a agent of of preservation and conservation as much as as change, but that also goes a bit to to Nora's point on on capitalism, and I think it's an important point that may, maybe we don't have time to wait for the the larger transformation. But while we wait, I think as uh, uh, as activists or, or researchers both, we need to understand the capital side better. We have a tendency to, to analyze and engage primarily with the forces that are against capital, but not necessarily studying the power that be and the capital forces themselves. Uh, and we, we happen to have some meeting points with, with the oil industry, and, and some of the, the environmental activists in Norway today will say that, in, in fact, it's the politicians that, are, that we wait for to do something. A lot of the business sector is ready to move. They're ready to go into something green. Uh, I spoke to ship owners who work in the oil industry now and say, we have to go into working with windmills because otherwise the bank will not give us a loan. The financial sector is changing. There's a lot of changes within capital that we need to engage with and understand and, and, and work with, as well as with workers that, that there are kind of complexities on, on all sides of, of the coins here. Uh, and, um, but I also think that as much as the, the Norwegian oil workers have a tendency to align themselves with uh, petroleum business uh, as conservative forces, when we talk about the class interest and the class, class conflict, they suddenly change. And, and they are afraid of this kind of capital mobility and their own vulnerability. And also stressing that they have, have more and more precarious work, although the social idea, that is the same in Norway and Nigeria, the, the perception of oil workers as privileged has also been a hindrance to understanding the changed working conditions and the vulnerability when it comes to health issues, environmental issues and, and other things. So I think that there's some kind of unpacking and talking that needs to, to be done. And 
on on a last point on on the um, maybe an optimist note uh when we have been engaging with workers oil workers in norway nigeria and and the us and when we have brought their voices together methodologically into focus groups something interesting happens when we talk to oil workers in norway in 2018 and 19 their argument the norwegian industry should continue because it's cleaner it's better and more social than oil industries in other countries when we bring voices from the us who say the same about their industry and voices from nigeria who say you don't know what you're saying when you're asking us to divest you don't know the poverty you will see the conversations in norway changed they did not agree, but there were a lot of conflicts within the group of Norwegian oil workers on what were the best criteria for a just transition. What was what what was justice? Some argued now more about poverty and and considering the needs of others compared to their own position, which I think is is somehow optimistic that if we keep kind of this dialogue between countries more effectively as activists and researchers, I think things can happen. Yeah. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you to our three presenters, as well as the editors uh, of this handbook. And if, if you haven't had the opportunity to uh, take a look, uh, and I know it's very recently released, uh, I urge everyone to do so because it's uh, uh, not just weighty in the size that Nora displayed uh, when she held it up, but also uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the geographic scope and the thematic scope with, uh, within this burgeoning field of environmental labor studies. So it's extremely timely and uh, will have a uh, long shelf life and will we'll shape our understandings for many years to come. So uh, delighted to uh, be, be a part and, and to learn so much from this discussion. Thank you to everybody and to our hosts at the University of Sao Paulo. Thank you guys, bye-bye. Good evening, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Thanks and bye.